we have been talking about a better life. And, and uh, well, I've been trying to encourage people to have a better life. We all want a better life. Uh, we don't want to be the same people that we, that we were, right? We all, want, we all want improvement in our lives. And we started out by talking in the, in the book of Psalms. So open your Bibles to Psalm chapter 1. And uh, the better life really is taken out of the six verses in Psalm 1. And uh, we talked first about what is needed to become or to have a better life. And uh, there are a couple things that are needed. First of all, there needs to be a departing. There needs to be a departing from maybe something that we've been doing or something that we at times get involved with. And in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, it said, Bless is the man, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. So we talked the first week about the blessing or the blessed man is someone who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. He's a guy, an individual, who doesn't get bad advice. That's what counsel is. So it's an individual who is getting advice from the right person. It's, uh, that's, that's very, very important. Uh, our ways are oftentimes determined by other people's words. So we have to be very careful that we are getting the right advice, generally from God, primarily, and then from uh, God's advisor. So seeking advice from the right place. We also talked about uh, getting or having the right attitude. And a person who gets the wrong advice has the wrong attitude. And they are, they are, always, uh, they are always combined and so we want to have the right attitude. And this is the second part of that verse, nor standeth in the way of sinners. So we want to make sure that we have the right attitude in life. And uh, we all know what a, what a bad attitude is like, and we all know how uh, potent that is, right? Uh, we're all at times around people who have, uh, who have negative attitudes, and that affects our actions, doesn't it? It affects how we think and, and how we act. So we talked about the advice, the attitudes, and then... Uh, very last in Psalm 1-1, he is a person who does not sit in the seat of the scornful. This is a person who has departed from the wrong advice, he's departed from the wrong attitude, and now he's departing from the wrong actions. And here's what happens. If you get the wrong advice, it gives you the wrong attitude and it leads you down to the wrong actions. So we have to be careful of all that. Last week, we looked at not just a departing man in verse 1, but we looked at a disciplined man. A person that has a better life is a disciplined individual. They're disciplined in a couple different ways. When you look at Psalm 1, verse 2, it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So we looked at two points last week. He is a delighting man, and primarily he is a deliberate delighter. He is deliberately delighting in the law of the Lord. He is a deliberate delighter. We also looked last week the fact that he is a meditating man. And his and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So not only is he a deliberate delighter, but he's a meaningful meditator. A, 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 a better life begins with the best instruction. You have to remember this when we're talking about how to achieve success, overall success in the Christian life. If you want a better life, again, this is not the power of positive thinking. This is the power of practical preaching. When we think of the better life, we're thinking about a life that means something, that has substance to it. Uh, oftentimes our lives, they, they, they have this uh, uh, lack of substance because we're trying to achieve a better life through the wrong means. So we've got to make sure we're achieving the better life through the right means. And uh, in verse 2 of Psalm 1, he is a deliberate delighter and a meaningful meditator. Okay, now by way of introduction this morning, let's talk about a better life. A better life requires a better approach. And uh, oftentimes we're stuck in the, 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 the old approach to a better life, Right? We've heard before that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, right? That is not the way to a better life. A better life requires a better approach. But see, development takes time, and that's verse 3. He is a departing man, he's a disciplined man, and now he is a developing man. He is a developing individual. I remember when I was in, uh, 
uh, in college in northern Minnesota. Uh, I, I, would, I would frequent the, the weight room. Uh, I know it doesn't look like that anymore. It looks like I frequent the buffet line, but, but um, I would frequent the, the weight room. I'd go in there, and uh, I remember some of these guys, they were just stacked. You know those kind of guys that you just like, I'm not gay, but I just would like to feel their arms, you know, and rub their back because I remember this one guy, his, he was connected from his ears to his shoulders. And he would, the bar, he had these things, they were called wrist straps. And uh, what that did is because his wrists were too weak for the muscles he could lift or for the weight he could lift, right? So he would wrap them around the bar and he'd do these things called shrugs. And he'd do this, this number right here. And the bar, I would stand back, and he had like six, seven plates on each side, and the bar would bend. And, and I remember he finished. He, you know, they always have to yell a little bit. Nah! Drop it, and he, you know, because everybody looks over and, you know, ooh, ah, right? So um, I remember I went over there. I was a little intimidated. I kind of backed off a little bit. And he knew I was intimidated. But what he said to me made a lot of sense. I didn't even say anything to him, but I just looked at him. Big eyes kind of doing this number, looking at him, you know? And, uh, and he says, he said this, we all have to start somewhere. We all have to start somewhere. And I, and I think about this all the time because a better life doesn't just happen. We all, we all want the results of a big savings account, but it takes time to develop, doesn't it? Well, the Christian life is just like that. So let me just give you just a piece of encouragement this morning. Wherever you're at in your Christian life, it's going to take time. We all want the results immediately, but it just doesn't happen that way. We all have to start somewhere in our own Christian lives. The journey takes time, but never give up. Just keep on plugging along. Now, what happens when you don't keep plugging along is you end up looking like me. I never gained the big, you know, connected muscles I mean, I've ripped some shirts in my life, but it wasn't because I was muscular. There's other reasons. Anyway, we've digressed. Now listen to this. Verse 1 and 2. Verse 1 and 2, we see the practice of the blessed man. Verse 1 and 2 is the practice. Verse 3, we begin to see the power of the blessed man. It goes from the practice to the power. Now let's look primarily at verse 3 today. Let me read this. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. When we look at verse 3, we begin by seeing point one, a proper planting. We see a proper planting. Now, when I was, uh, when I was a kid, which I, I feel like was just the other day, my, I, I, my mind thinks I'm a kid. My body doesn't feel like that anymore. Hence, I was in the hospital. Anyway, but when I was a kid, my dad and I, we'd drive around. And uh, I don't know if your dads were like this, but uh, they could identify every car we drove by. That was from like the 40s to like the 70s. And he just knew. Any, any of you older folks like that? Come on, raise your hand. Okay, okay, good. So you, when you're driving by, you say, that's a 1965 Buick or whatever. Everything was a Buick. Is that all they made? Anyway, so, and then they would, another one would drive by, well, that's a 1948 this, and that's a 1973 this, and I couldn't do that. Now they all somewhat look the same, but apparently there were some taillight issues. Anyway, my dad could do that with, uh, with farming equipment. He could do that with farming equipment. We'd be driving down the road, and uh, he'd look off into the distance, and he'd say, well, that's a... Uh, of this, and, and, and I'm just like, what is that? And I mean, it was, I was intrigued because it was kind of cool, but I was like, what is it? And he'd point out all this different equipment. Some equipment was for cultivating. Now, the cultivating equipment is very, very important because what would happen is, is, uh, is, is that turns the soil over. It softens the soil, which is really important for, for growth, and uh, it helps the, the roots go in deeper and helps uh, hold moisture, but... But, uh, but it were, the, the, the cultivating equipment is really important to the planting, uh, to creating a good environment for plants to grow in. Then they had the, the planters, these big, long planting equipment. And, uh, and that would take the seed, and it would t- take the seed, and it would place it a, a, the, a perfect distance apart. It was pretty cool, actually. And, uh, and, and, and that was really important because uh, a seed, a tree, or a plant needs a, a certain distance for, for the, to, to promote the greatest growth. 
So the planting equipment was really, then they had the fertilizing equipment. The fertilizing equipment. Now those were the coolest, I think, because they had tires that were like 30 feet tall, looked like monster trucks you could drive. How many of you have wanted to drive underneath one of those? I've always just, dis- I have, I, every time I'm driving behind one, I'm like, I think I could make it, you know? I think I could make it. I think I could. My wife, she, she's looking at me, she says, I know what you're thinking. And I'm like, I'm not thinking that, I am just think I could make it. Anyway, so <laughs> they were the coolest. Now the fertilization equipment is important to the whole environment of, of, of promoting growth in, uh, in a plant. Because what that does is it gives the right, the right amount of, uh, of, nowadays it's herbicides and insecticides, and pest, you know, all that stuff that causes cancer. But what it does is it also gives nutrients to, uh, to the plant, to develop it right. So when we get to verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season, it's very important because all of the farming equipment is there for a purpose. It was there to enhance the quality, the quality of the environment to increase crop performance. You needed the right plant, in this case, the right tree, in the right place to promote the greatest growth. So it was very, very important. And water is essential for growth. So here in verse 3, having this intentional planting of a tree in a specific environment will bring about the greatest development. That's this tree planted by the rivers of water. And let me say this, that a developing man needs the right environment to promote the greatest growth. A developing Christian, if you want a better life, you have to have the right conditions. You can't just have any conditions. People say, well, well, basically, let's just throw this out there, any church will do. They'll say that, that any worship music will do. They'll say that anything will do. They say that any prayer, any, anything will do. And that's just not true. I'm just telling you, from, from a real life, it's just not true. You need the right conditions to promote the right growth. The better the conditions the better the growth. That's why you see some Christians who are, who are really excelling in their Christian life, who, are, who just have a real in tune touch with God, who just love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. And you say, what is different about that guy? What is different about that girl? Well, have you looked at the conditions? What are they doing in their life? Do, they, do you have the right conditions? Right growth takes the right conditions. We have to be in the right environment. Not just anything will do. Not just any soil will do. Not just any fertilizer will do. You have to have the right conditions. So let me ask you this. Do you have the right conditions for growth in your own life? Now we start out real uh, simple. And we ask us the question about salvation. That is where growth essentially begins. That's what we call the new birth. And without that, we can't have, we don't have anything else. That's why some people, the Bible, the Bible says that the natural man, that's the unsaved man, receives not the things of the Spirit of God. It says it is foolishness to him because he's spiritually discerned. Meaning this, that an unsaved, an unredeemed, a person who does not know they're going to heaven when they die, that does not have the Holy Spirit living in them, does not understand the things of God. It begins by seeing the salvation issue. That's God working for you. By the, that, that's not you working for God. That's God working for you. We use this verse quite frequently. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Here's the reality. It's not of your works. It's not of your works. It's of God's works. You are saved because of what God has done for you. That's salvation. Then we get to the sanctification issue. And that's not God working for you. That's God working on you. And that comes from John 15, 3. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Then we get to the service issue. And that's not God working for you, God working on you. That's God working through you. 
That's God working through you. That's Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, I can't do anything that's good. Paul acknowledged that. He said that I know that is in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So no good thing that comes out of me is actually of me. Did you know that? It's only of God. We have to have the salvation, the sanctification, and the service understood in totality before we can say, let's start to cultivate or bring about a, 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 a condition in our life that, that, that increases change and that gets us to a better life. In order to have a better life, you have to have an understanding of that. So we have to ask the question, what is the condition of your salvation, sanctification, and service? Now, let's look at two things real quickly as subpoints, and that is the root and the fruit. The root and the fruit. Now, the most important part of any plant is, is really the root system. It's, it's, what's, it's what's underneath, and in this case, it's that which is seen the least which matters the most. It's always the root system. And I, I, I know my kids, when they go out there, they come out here and they, they pull weeds, and uh, we always say when you pull a weed, you pull it by the what? The root, why? Because if you don't get the root, the weed will come back bad. I just say pave it all, and you don't have to worry about ever pulling a weed. I do not like weeds. I had a garden once, and that's a whole other story. I had a garden once. Just remember that. I had a garden once. So we have to understand that this is the most important part of, of the, the, the nutrients and the growth to help a person develop. Let me say this, that a deliberate delighter in the law of the Lord and a meaningful meditator in the law of the Lord help develop an individual. They help develop an individual. This is stuff that you don't generally see. This is that integral root system that maybe, that maybe is hidden from most people. People don't generally see you in your quiet time with the Lord. But can I say this? That that is one of the most important things for development in your life. That's the root system. That's the thing that people don't generally see. Can I say this? That people don't see your meditating. They don't see your memorizing. That's all hidden. That's all kind of behind closed doors. They don't see the root. They see the fruit. And so they assume by a tremendous amount of fruit that you've got stability in your root. But people don't see the roots. And we're not here to impress people. In Psalm 19, a very familiar verse, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. See, we're not trying to impress people. The root system, there's nothing really impressive about the root system, is there? I mean, I don't know how many of you guys have gone out and said, wow, look at the roots on this thing. Look at them, they're just massive. You know, you go out there and you, you experience the roots by the fruit, right? You go out there and you're like, wow, look at that. Look at that apple. That's sinful. That's a, that's a Garden of Eden apple right there. And you're like, wow. And you're like, that has got a good root system. And probably a lot of chemicals. We won't go into that. <laughs> People will experience the roots by the fruit. And when we get to 1 Timothy 4, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profit may appear to all. So when you are partaking, when the root is partaking of those nutrients that it needs to, planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, here's the fruit right here, that thy profiting may appear to all. The hidden things that people do not see are the things that they, that they experience by what they can't see. And being planted by the rivers of water is the best place to be because you'll never thirst there. It has the perfect environment for growth. One commentator said that he has a never failing supply of nourishment and refreshment. The spiritual root system is the most important thing in a Christian's life. Are you rooted in Christ? 
Are you saved? Are you being sanctified? Is God serving? Are you serving through God? But then from there, what else has happened in your life? Do you have the right environment? Are you in the right church? I think you all are, by the way. <laughs> that was a joke. Amen. Somebody said amen. Who was that? Howard. Amen. Okay, well, at least we got one amen. It sounded a little weak, but... Amen. 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 Okay. I hope my wife says amen. I don't hear many women say amen. Do you? I mean, I don't know. Is it a thing? Under her breath, she's like... <clears throat> Mm. <laughs> I can just see her when she's over there coughing. She's like, mm, mm, mm. Anyway, we digressed again. Let's talk real quickly about the fruit. The fruit. So because of verse 1 and 2, then 3. So a departing man and a disciplined man become a developing man. One commentator said that we must remember that the tree doesn't eat the fruit. Others eat it. The tree never eats the fruit. See, we think that we're going to be uh, extremely blessed by all the fruit that's produced from our tree. But really, you know who's, who experiences it? It's others. It's other people experience that. They're the ones that are the, the partakers. They are the primary beneficiary of fruit. It's others. It's always others. James Vernon McGee said that good trees don't bring forth fruit all of the time. He goes on to say that there is a season, a season for fruit bearing. Now that's interesting because we think that we ought to be producing fruit all the time. That there is always, we talked about the ups and the downs, right? In Sunday school, like uh, at, at times it's like some days are better than others and that's the truth. Sometimes there's just a tremendous amount of fruit, this outpour in your life. And we look and we say, man, look at all the fruit in our lives. It's just amazing. And you guys all partake of that. And when, when, when you're spiritual, then you all partake of it. When you're spiritual, then you partake of it. And then, you, and then where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. I mean, there's just a tremendous amount of fruit. And everybody says, what a, what a, what a bunch of produce. <laughs> I don't know what they say. They probably don't say that, though. But they say, man, this is, uh, I can experience your spirituality. And you can experience my spirituality. When I'm doing what I need to be doing, and the root system is stable and getting the right nutrients, then everybody else partakes of that. A properly planted tree will bring forth fruit at the appointed time. An apple doesn't produce in the middle of winter, unless you're in a, another state, maybe. Do apples produce in another state in the middle of winter, or does it shut down totally? It probably shuts down totally. How do we have apples, then, in the middle of winter? Anybody think of this? Storage. Yeah. Foreign country. Yeah. Yeah, and probably a lot of preservatives, too. Enjoy your apple pie this afternoon. You'll live to be 90. Right, Grandma Kate? Amen. Okay, let's move on. Here is what I'm talking about. When we're talking about fruit bringing forth in its season, here's a good example. How about this? Do you have peace during the times of uncertainty? You see, most people aren't going to sit and watch you at your desk as you're typing away doing your work and say, wow, that there, that's a guy that has a tremendous amount of peace. But as you bring forth fruit in your season, you may have peace in the times of uncertainty. Uh, it was Psalm 4, 8 deals with this. I both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me uh, dwell in safety. Do you have peace in the times of uncertainty? How about patience during the time of affliction? When you're bringing forth your fruit in your season, you have patience in the times of affliction. When things get really hard in your life and you're really struggling and they say, man, that is that person right there just has a tremendous amount of faith. And these are good things. We're supposed to bring forth uh, these, these things. Listen to 1 Timothy 6.11. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience. How are we going to follow after patience if we're not afflicted? Because it says in James 1.3, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. So don't we have to have a trying of our faith to work patience? And then at that point in time, people will say, boy, that person right there is bringing forth fruit in his season. 
Not all the time. But when it's needed, there's the patience. We have to be properly planted, friends. We have to be properly planted. We have to have the right environment that produces the right development. But not only is there a, a proper planting, there's supposed to be prevailing prosperity. Prevailing prosperity. And in Psalm 1-3, at the end of the passage, it says this, His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Here we see that proper planting leads to prevailing prosperity. We're not talking about the prosperity gospel. We're not talking about uh, somebody who says that giving monetarily brings gain momentarily. What I'm saying is that what you do will prosper if you have the right perspective and understand it completely. I believe that there's an additional blessing for faithfulness. I think faithfulness brings fruitfulness. Does it necessarily mean that we're going to have a tremendous amount of money all the time? No, that's not what that means. A person can be exceptionally faithful and, and, and undeniably fruitful and be broke. Because faithfulness brings fruitfulness. I believe somewhat that there is prosperity in this, you understand. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Can I say this in Psalm 92, 12 to 14? It says that the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. You know how a, how a tree, I, I love trees, by the way, even though I cut down an entire forest out here. I love trees. I love trees. I love, I love leaves. I love leaves. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a Midwesterner, and I love the Midwest. I don't like winter. Does that make sense? But I love the Midwest. I don't like mosquitoes, and I don't like the cold, but I can't stand the hot, humid climates. Like, you get me down on the southern tip of Florida where my brother-in-law lives, that is purgatory to me. I hate that place. Like with a passion, it's so hot, it turns 70 degrees and it makes it feel like a roaster oven. It's brutal. I like trees and I like, I like leaves, you know? I like when the leaves change, but I don't like when the leaves fall because we have to rake them, number one, but number two, I think, I, I think a tree looks dead, doesn't it? How do you determine a tree that's dead in the fall. You can't. You've got to wait till spring. Right? You have to wait till spring to be able to see it. Well, I think what, verse, what this verse is saying is that the leaf of the tree will not wither. That means this. It will always bear a testimony of health. D.L. Moody said this. He said that all the Lord's trees are evergreens. They are always bearing the appearance of health. And I think when a Christian is doing what they ought to be doing, when a Christian is, 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 uh, is getting away from the wrong stuff and going into the right stuff, when they are departing, when they are disciplined, and then when they begin to develop, when they're properly planted, there is a prevailing prosperity in their life. And I think that they always have this appearance of health. And I think that we do, as Christians, have an appearance of health if we're doing the right things. Though we might not be producing fruit all the time and only in our season, I think people will look at us and say, that right there, that's a Christian. And I can tell because they have an appearance of health. Their, their leaf isn't withering. We're more of an evergreen. You know, it's unfortunate that people think that prosperity is always tangible. They think it's always like right here in cash. That doesn't necessarily mean prosperity. I've said, I, I, I've said to you, I think I'm, the wealth, I, I'm, I'm one of the wealthiest people I know because I think true wealth is, is being content with what you have because you don't want anything else. Prosperity doesn't mean riches. 
Now, prosperity to the world in their paradigm means riches. But there's a, there, there's, there's a lot of things kind of seemingly paradoxical in the Bible. For instance, let me give you just a couple of them. In Matthew 10, 39, he that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. We see in Matthew 19, 30, but many that are first shall be last. Kind of, kind of a paradox. How is that possible? We get into 2 Corinthians and it says this in verse, or chapter 12, verse 9, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Seemingly paradoxical. But here's the, here's the thing. Is I think that a Christian prospers all the time. Maybe not financially. But a Christian will prosper all the time when they are properly planted. When they are properly planted. If you are deliberately delighting and you're meaningfully meditating, properly planted, I believe you're going to be a developing Christian and you will have prevailing prosperity in your life. Does that mean you're going to have pockets full of cash? No, no. I wish. I wish it was always the case. I wish I'd get up here and say, man, you just, you give to the church. And God will bless you. And now listen, I will tell you this. You can't outgive God. I will tell you that. You cannot outgive God. I've tried. <laughs> Someone once said, do you give to get? And this guy responded, yes, I give to get so I can continue to give. And I thought, well, that's kind of neat. I'm going to use that. And I just did. It's pretty neat. Prosperity is more than just substance monetarily. We have something to look forward to in eternity. And that's a wonderful thing. And friends, if you're here today and you don't know where you're spending your eternity, if you don't know for absolute certain that when you die, you're going to spend an eternity with the Lord, I want to share with you something that's, that's just burdened my heart for years. And that is this, that you can know. When I was in the hospital this week, we... Um, I met, I met just a tremendous amount of people. Uh, I met a, a lady named Jess Hess, H-E-S-S. -S. That was a, I was fun. I was like, Hess, are you kidding me? My last name's Hess, how cool is that? You know, and I'm laughing and smiling. And, and uh, she, she was like, why, basically, why are you here? You don't look ill. And I'm like, this is great. You know, Jess Hess, this is I said, do you ever get things to a different last name? And she's like, oh, I get stuff to, to huff and, and huss and all this thing. And I'm like, well, that's cool, you know, and. We met another lady named uh, Kate, uh, Katie Malone. We met a, 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 another guy named Dr. Dirks and, and, and all these people. And, and uh, met, uh, I met this guy, his name was Anthony. And I had been praying for him this week. And he came into the room. He came in and he, he did the EKG. And uh, he put this mask on. And, and, he's, and, I, and I said, don't worry, I'm not contagious. <laughs> and he laughs, and he takes his mask off, and he says, well, you just never know. And I'm like, I don't think I'm contagious, but that's what the last guy said, and he died. Anyway, so, you know, I, I just, I, we were just laughing and yucking it up, and, and, uh, and, and he knew I was a pastor of a church, and, and, uh, and I said to him, I, I, he, uh, he came in, and uh, everybody else was gone. He came in, sat down in his chair next to me. And he said to me, he says, uh, he kind of put his feet up on the chair. He says, I'm not just saying this. He says, I'm not just saying this. There's nobody around. I'm not saying this. If I wasn't a nurse, I would want to pursue the pastorate. And he asked me, he says, he says, what made you pursue the pastorate? And in my mind, I'm thinking, this is awesome. Like, I, you just asked me to give you the gospel, you know. So I couldn't get in my back pocket to get my wallet because I had all these things in me. But I had my phone, and I pull my phone out, and I say, I say Anthony, I want to show you this. Is a, I saw a guy do this many years ago, and, and I, just, I, just wanted to be a, I just wanted to learn more about God's Word. I never went to Bible college to become a pastor. I said, I just wanted to learn more. But I said, I, said, I want this hand right here to represent you and me, and I want this wallet to represent sin. And I was using my iPhone, so just use your imagination. And I said, I said, here we are with our sin. And the Bible says that God loves us but hates our sin. The Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that there is a payment for sin that must be made. You know what that payment is? I said, the payment says that the wages of sin is death. I said, Anthony, somebody has to die. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin, for my sin. And Anthony was just sitting there, and he's captivated, just like locked in, kind of like you all are right now, just focusing. And I said, I want this hand to represent Jesus. I said, he came to this earth to die on the cross. 
Because the wages of sin was death. The wages of sin isn't church membership, Anthony. I said the wages of sin isn't water baptism. The wages of sin isn't giving money. The wages of sin is death. I asked him, I said, Anthony, if you were to die today, are you sure? Do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? And he says, I, I don't know. And I said, well, if you place your faith right now in Christ alone as your Savior, you can go to heaven. I said, it's just that simple. It's right here when you place your faith in Christ. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. It doesn't say of works. For by grace you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. I said, Anthony, if you trust Christ as your Savior, you will go to heaven when you die. And I said, here I am in this, in this hospital bed. I said, I know absolutely for sure where I'm going when I die. And I said it with a smile. Now, I, I told him, I said, I, and I, I did say this, my wife was my witness, I said, I don't want to be on the next gurney, but <laughs> I said, I, said, I, I, I know that I'm going I, I to I'm gonna be with the Lord when I die because I have personally placed my faith in Christ alone. Uh, he had left, and, um, or no, actually, the other nurse came in, and she's a believer. She's a, a pastor's daughter from uh, a church out in Muscatine. She walked in, cracked the door, and she's like, oh, I just wanted to make sure everything was okay, and she shut the door. She knew what was going on. She knew I was giving this, this guy the gospel, and she knew that. Like, after, afterwards, she, we, we sat down, she came in, she's like, so did you give Tony the gospel, or Anthony the gospel? I said, I did, I did. I said, I was really perceptive, and, and she laughed in this whole thing. And, uh, and, but what a joy in my life. What a joy in my life to be able to share. She said, she said when we were there, she's like, I don't know if, she said something about like, I don't know of any other person that is just that forthright about their faith. And I'm like, wow, all right, yeah, I'm Mr. Evangelist when I'm dying, you know what I mean? <laughs> Praise God, I know where I'm going, you know? I didn't say that to her, but, but I'm thinking to myself, that is how we all ought to be. His leaf also shall not wither. And I look at that situation, I'm like, did I have the presence of health did I have the testimony of health? Did she look at me and say, this guy, if he dies, he'll be all right. And you know what the truth is? Is that if I died that day and if I died tomorrow, and God forbid any of us die tomorrow, okay? But here's the reality. We can know where we're going when we die simply by placing our faith in Christ alone as our Savior. And friends, if you haven't done that today, it's not about works. It's not about what you've done. It's not about being here in this place, giving money to this ministry. It's about you placing your faith in Christ alone as your Savior.